Romans chapter 3. What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because unto them were committed the oracles of God. The Jews were given the oracles of God, which is quite an incredible um, responsibility. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, Thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather, as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have both proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable, there is none that doeth good, no, not one. We'll get to verse 11 as we go, but none that understandeth is talking about spiritual things. It's like people aren't interested in spiritual things today. Their throat is an open sepulchre, with their tongues they have used to seed. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. This going to be a very profound scripture that we're going to be touching upon later on. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall there no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the, by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So verse 10, there is none that righteous, no, not one. Verse 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. We establish the law. We're picking up from verse 3 and 4. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Very interesting verses these are. Verse 3. What if some did not believe? Believe what? Well, according to verse 2, it's the oracles of God. What if some of the Jews did not believe what Jesus Christ said of himself while he was here on earth? And they didn't. Look at Mark 5. Mark chapter 5, verse 16 and 17. And they saw, and they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coast. They didn't believe him, they didn't want anything to do with him, so they wanted him out of their coast. Get him out of here. 
How sad was that? Luke 4, Luke chapter 4, verse 28 and 29. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him unto the brow of the hill whereupon, sorry, whereon their city was built that they might, might cast him down headlong. Can you believe what they wanted to do to him? The Jews. They didn't believe him. Who he was. Matthew 27. Matthew 27, verse 15. Matthew 27, verse 15. To 26. Now at the feast, now at that feast, the governor was wont to release unto the, the people a prisoner whom they would. And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Wherefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto, him, sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. For the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas, and this I just couldn't believe, look at this, and destroy Jesus. Can you believe that? The chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. You talk about a zealous mob making irrational decisions, screaming out, Let Jesus Christ be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. No, he wasn't. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be upon us and on our children, from that day even to this day. Horrific. Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. The Jews did not believe what Jesus Christ said of himself, while he was here on earth. The Messiah had come and they'd missed him. They knew not the scriptures. Just like today, nothing's changed. Does that mean that whoever believes what Jesus said is still lost in their sins? Of course not. Faith is not effective just because it is faith or just because it is sincere. You have to apply it. If something is so, it is so, whether you believe it or not. Just because you don't believe it doesn't change the consequences of not believing. I don't believe in hell, somebody says. That doesn't change the consequences of not believing. Hell is a reality and you will go there if you have rejected Jesus Christ as your saviour. It's a reality. It's the truth. Take gravity. For an example, you may not believe in it. You may preach against it. You can think as positively as you like that gravity won't keep you or drag you down. But the moment you jump off the roof of your house, you'll find out the stark reality. Truth is truth. It doesn't matter what you think or what you believe, truth is truth. Whether you can prove it or not, Truth is truth. The word of God is truth. Let's just run a few references in regard to truth. Psalm 31. These are only a few, but these are amazing. When I was studying this last night, I just love these verses. Psalm 31, verse 5. 
Into thine hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. There is one God of truth. Daniel 10, 21. Again, a verse that's coming up all the time. Daniel 10, 21. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. Only occurs once there. The scripture of truth. What a great verse. God is a God of all truth. You have a book in the authorised version that is the scripture of truth. It's all truth. It's everything you need. There is no error in it. Genesis to Revelation, a perfect Bible that God has given to you. The scripture of truth. That's what you want. That's what you want to seek after. Get to know, read, study. John 1.14 And the Word, capital W, that's Jesus Christ, was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus Christ was full of truth. John 8.32 John 8.32 And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Everybody wants to be free. People want, you know, um, freedom in their lives, liberty in their lives, peace in their lives, love in their lives. You get it, and you only get it through truth. And the truth is found in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ in John 14 verse 6 says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Religion saves no one. It damns more people to hell than any war has ever done. Jesus Christ is the truth. People are looking for the truth in all kinds of places. But until you come to Jesus Christ, you will never find the truth. Look at verse 17. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. He dwelleth with you now, but when Jesus Christ has died and he sends forth the comforter afterwards, he shall be in you. He dwelleth with you now, But when Jesus Christ has died and ascended back to the Father, he sends the Comforter and then he comes to dwell in you. John 16, 13. John 16, verse 13. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. The Spirit of truth guides you into all truth. Hence why you don't have to go to a Bible college to learn the Scriptures. Because when the truth has been revealed to you, when you become a Christian, you've committed your life to Jesus Christ and serving Him, you've had your sins forgiven, He has washed you, you've asked Him to save you, then the Spirit of truth comes to dwell within you, lives within you. When you study the book, the Scripture of truth, then he leads and guides you through this book. God speaks to you through his word, folks. That's why you need to spend time in this book. The scripture of truth. And let the spirit of truth, isn't that wonderful? The spirit of truth guide you through this book. Galatians 4.16 I used to love quoting this one all the time. Am I become your enemy? If I remember it. Am I become your enemy? For... 16. Yeah, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? I used to quote that, preaching, you know, preaching in these different churches or dealing with people. Am I become your enemy? I'm not trying to be your enemy, but I'm telling you the truth. Am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? What a great verse that is. Galatians 5 7. Ye did run well. We've just had this quoted and misapplied, haven't we? Ye did run 
well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Listen, if, if you're a Christian and you've got this book and you're living for the Lord and you're trying to, you know, give your whole life to serving Jesus Christ, you're walking in truth. That's what life's about, serving Jesus Christ with all your heart, mind, soul and spirit. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Someone tries to take this book away from you, or somebody tries to you know, deviate you from the, the straight and narrow, then yes, ye did run well. Who did hinder you? But now that you've got into this book, you're walking with the Lord Jesus Christ, you're walking the way of truth. Ephesians 1.13, only a few more. But these are great verses. I was getting excited when I was reading these yesterday. Ephesians 1.13 In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. See, ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. That's the word of truth. That's what saves you. You could get every religion, every single religion. Somebody's just quoted in there, there's 180 different religions in the UK or something similar. All these different religions, get in one room. Get the the head of every religion in one room. And seek out the truth. What, What is, what is a message that you could preach without offending anyone? We've said before, the only message you could preach without offending any other religion would be love. Everybody loves one another. And that is the, the slop that we have today in modern Christianity. You've just got to love everyone. Not offend anyone. Forget truth, just love everyone. Everybody's got to love everyone, we've got to love this, love that. It's a milksop, lovey-dovey Christianity, modern Christianity today, that saves no one. And that's not the truth. That's not the gospel. Loving God is not the gospel. The death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ for your sins is the gospel, the blood atonement. It's only the Jesus Christ perfect, incorruptible blood that can wash away your sins. So you get all these religions together, what are you going to speak? What's the truth? The truth, the word of truth is the gospel of your salvation and that is it. Everybody is a sinner, everybody is lost and if they come through Jesus Christ, you'll never make it to heaven. That's the truth. John 17... No, sorry, 2, two Thessalonians 2.12. Go there first. We'll come to John 17. 2 Thessalonians 2.12. thought this was a great verse. That they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. They're damned if they believe not the truth. That's what the Bible says. These 180 religions, listen, you come through Jesus Christ and you can make it. But if you don't, if you go through Mary, or you go through Allah, or you go through Confucius, or you go through the Book of Mormon, or you go through the New World Translations, you know, the New World Translations for the JWs, or the Christadelphians, or the Unitarians, you go through all that stuff and you'll never make it. You go through works, you'll never make it. It's faith in Jesus Christ. And if you don't come to the faith in Jesus Christ and he forgives your sins, you're damned to hell. That's truth. 2 Timothy 2.15 We're quoting this a lot lately as well. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You've got to rightly divide it. Calvinists can't. Hyperdispensationists can't. Charismatics can't. They don't rightly divide the word of truth. Hence why they fall into error and they go off at tangents and they teach things that didn't ought to be taught in churches. I just had a letter yesterday um, from a woman. She writes to me from Australia. She's a real Calvinist. She idolises John Calvin. She idolises uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And she writes to me telling me, you know, where I'm wrong and that I've got to come under the authority of John Calvin, all this kind of stuff, man. So I send her nice little letters back. I don't think she should be writing to me again after the, the last one I wrote yesterday. But they fall into all this trash, all this slop, all this you know, shallow teaching of the word of God because they follow a man rather than the scripture of truth. People mess themselves up so much. We 
We didn't do John 17, 17, did we? John 17, 17. John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You're sanctified by the word of God. It's truth. A couple more, and then we'll move on. In fact, 2 Timothy 2, 15, which we've just done, look at verse 18. 2 Timothy 2, verse 18. 2 Timothy 2, verse 18. Who concerning the truth have erred, erred. Saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrown the faith of some. Some corrupt the word of God and they change it. And they fall into error. 2 Timothy 3, 7. 2 Timothy 3, verse 7. Ever learning. Edu- education is a God of this world today. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. GCSEs, A-levels, degrees, you know, what is it, PhDs, Masters, what M- MAs, is it? and masters, all these things, ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And yet the knowledge of the truth, belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, a child can understand. You can get saved at a very young age. You don't have to have all this education to get saved. Isn't that wonderful? Yet these people are being educated out of God, out of believing in God the Creator, to believing in the science fiction of evolution they're being educated out of it ever learning but never able to come to the knowledge of of the truth which a little child could believe and get saved this book is incredible do you know what this book this book a child could understand and yet the greatest minds of the world can't it depends on how you look at it does that make sense it depends on how you look at it A little child can read John 3.16 and get saved. And a PhD or a bloke who's got his masters or all these letters after his name could read this and think, I don't understand this at all. I can't get this. Of course he can't. The natural man receiveth not but, but natural things. He can't receive the things of the Spirit. When you start correcting this book, the light stops. So don't be a Bible corrector, be a Bible believer. Look at verse 8. We've ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janice and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. They resist the truth. So do you want the truth or not? Truth is truth. You either want it or you don't. You either seek it or you don't. And sadly, even in modern Christianity today, and with most of the churches that we have visited even of recent months, they don't want the truth. The truth of the Word of God. They're not interested in living a Christian, holy, sanctified life serving the Lord. They're not interested. Well, I am. And some of you are, which is great. 2 Timothy 4 verse 4. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and be turned unto fables. That's what's happening today in modern day church. They've turned their ears away from the truth. They're being turned unto fables. Calvinism is a fable. Charismatic stuff they're teaching today, it's fables. It's distortion of the scriptures. 1 John 2, 21. 1 John 2, 21. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and no lie is of the truth. Truth is truth. You don't have to believe it, but you'll never beat it. Truth is truth. It stays. 2 Timothy, sorry, 2 John 1, verse 4. 2 John, verse 4. I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth as we have received a commandment from the Father. Your children are walking in truth. That must be a great feeling if your family is walking in truth. 
We've spoken this morning that most of our families aren't walking in truth. How sad is that? Yet they have the opportunity of doing it. Every, you know, all of our families could be here, walking in truth, serving together, joined together. What a family that would be! But they've decided, no, I want materialism. I want money. I want fame. I want fortune. I want a career. I want to do it my way. Oh yeah, I'll be a Christian, but I don't want to give my whole life to serving the Lord. You know, I want to live for myself. How sad. What a waste. Do you think that's going to stand the, the judgment fire of God? They'll be burnt up. A complete waste of time. You're wasting your time. 3 John verse 4. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. So getting back to Romans 3 verse 3 and 4. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. This is really interesting. Follow it closely. As it is written that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. We'll come to that. It's very interesting. So truth is truth, and it really doesn't matter whether you have a different opinion, truth will prevail. It is truth that matters. It is truth that counts. Which leads on to that great verse in verse 4. Let God be true, but every man a liar. Look at Numbers 23, 19. Numbers 23, verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken and shall he not make it good? Shall he not make it good? God is not a man that he should lie. God doesn't lie. He can't lie. Titus 1 verse 2. Titus 1. Verse 2. In hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie. God cannot lie. One more, Jeremiah 9, verse 3 to 6. Jeremiah 9. I'm rushing about a bit because I've got a lot to get through. But it's really interesting. It gets better. Jeremiah 9, verse 3 to 6. And they bend their tongues like their, like their bow. Like they bow for lies, bow for lies. But they are not valiant for the truth. They're not valiant for the truth. Are you? These people aren't valiant for the truth upon the earth. For they proceed from evil to evil, and they know not me, saith the Lord. Take ye heed every one of his neighbour, and trust ye not in any brother. Don't trust anyone. Let God be true, but every man a liar. Don't trust anyone. Don't put your faith in man, in preachers, in pastors. Don't put your faith in governments or leaders. Put your faith in God and in his word. For every brother will utterly supplant and every neighbour will walk with slanders. If it's you or me, the, the way of the world thinking is going to be you. <laughs> if I have to decide whether it's you or me for survival, it's going to be me for surviving and you're going to take the hit. That's the way the world looks at things. Everybody will utterly supplant. If it's if two people going for the promotion, you know, the world's point of view, they'll do everything they can to supplant the person and you get the promotion. Don't trust anyone. They'll be your friend and colleague at work, but they'll stab you in the back if they can get one up on you, one over on you. Don't ever think they weren't. If you trust in people, you are very, very shallow. Very superficial and you don't understand about life. Or what? It's in a man's heart... Take ye heed, every one of his neighbour, and trust ye not in any brother. Trust no one. I told you before that, that um, um, somebody told me this once, a Jewish dad with his, his son, said, I'm going to teach you about the, 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 the greatest um, lesson of life, son. He says, stand on the table. He says, look forward, shut your eyes, and when I say, fall back, fall back, and I'll be here. I'm going to teach you a great lesson about trust. So his son gets up on the table, and he faces forward, and he shuts his eyes. He said, Dad, I love you, I trust you. He says, right, okay, son, fall back. Falls back, and his dad steps to the side, lets him fall. Hits the ground, hurts himself, bursts into tears, crying. He says, son, that's your, that's your biggest, that's your greatest lesson in life. Trust no one, even those that you love. 
You can't trust any, to a certain degree we can, but not 100%. I hope you understand that, it's not just me who's thinking this. Because we let each other down. But Jesus Christ never lets you down. This book will never let you down. So you trust in Jesus Christ 100%, you trust in the Bible 100%, you trust in each other the best you possibly can. Oh, you're looking a bit sad and sorrowful now, aren't you? (coughs) That's the way it is. And they will deceive every one of his neighbour and will not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies and weary themselves to commit iniquity. Thine habitation is in the midst of deceit. Through deceit they refuse to know me, saith the Lord. Isn't that amazing? Through deceit they refuse to know me, saith the Lord. Isn't that incredible? Through deceit. I don't want to know you, Lord. I want to go my own way. I refuse to know or talk about things of God. I don't want to talk about religion. Truth is truth. Romans 3 verse 4, let God be true but every man a liar, is a verse to live by throughout your life. And the sooner you wake up to that, the better for you it will be. Trust no one 100%, just God and this authorised version Bible, which is the word of God. That's what you want to trust. Not Bible correctors or rejectors or anybody like that, just the word of God. Billy Sunday said this, and this is excellent. Where the Bible says one thing and scholarship says another, scholarship can go plumb to the devil. I like that. Where the Bible says one thing and scholarship says another, scholarship can go plumb to the devil. That's the position to take. No matter how intellectual you th- they, the p- person coming across thinks they are, or how intellectual you think you are, this book is what you want to submit to. In Romans 3, 4, look at this, very interesting. God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, as it is written, so Paul is turning to a written authority here, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. If you know your scriptures, you know roughly whereabouts this is. I'm sure most of you do. Psalm 51 verse 4, turn there. Paul is quoting from Psalm 51, David's writings. I love it when they quote from each other. Paul quoting from David. Psalm 51 verse 4, read it carefully. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Look at them both. Romans 3 verse 4, Psalm 51 verse 4. In Romans 3 verse 4, God forbid, yet let, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be just in, in thy sayings. The sayings of Romans 3 verse 4 are the oracles of God, according to verse 2. In other words, what God said. The sayings are what God said. That's the oracles of God. But look at the the last half of Romans 3, verse 4. And mightest overcome when thou art judged. Overcome when thou art judged. You note here, this is... I found fascinating that God that God is the one being judged (coughs) read it someone is going to judge God now we go back to the verse Paul is quoting from in Psalm 51 verse 4 here David is praying note in Psalm 51 verse 4 David praying, Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest to me clear, when thou judgest. In Psalm 51 verse 4, sin is being judged. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. The next phrase is matched in Romans 3 verse 4, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, but look at the last phrase, be clear when thou judgest. Psalm 51 verse 4. In the original quote, the Lord is not being judged. He's doing the judging. 
So here in Romans 3 verse 4, Paul, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, is making what we call a free quote of what David said. You know, they don't have to quote word for word. The Holy Spirit can change it. We've told you before, it's so interesting, the word faith occurs twice in the Old Testament, remember? And one is no faith, and the other, his faith. And his faith in himself as a human being, trusting in your own faith, your own faith, saves no one. It's faith in Christ that saves. So, it was a, it was a, a, a verse that Paul took regarding faith in, was it Habakkuk? Habakkuk 2.4, is it? You have to check that out. And then, um, brings it into Romans. He changes one word. The Holy Spirit guided Paul to do that. The Holy Spirit has guided Paul to do this. When you put these two passages together, Psalm 51 verse 4, Romans 3 verse 4, what you get is this. When the Lord judges sinners at the great white throne judgment, there will be people accusing God of things in an attempt to justify themselves. They will try to blame and condemn God. How many people have said, when I, get to, when I stand before God, I'm going to tell him a few things? I used to think, no, you're not. They're going to be allowed to. You listen to this. Job 40, verse 8, is very significant in relationship to this verse. Job 40, verse 8. Will thou also disannul my judgment? Will thou condemn me that thou mayest be righteous I'll read that again will thou also disannul my judgment will thou condemn me that thou mayest be righteous see where it's going when that person stands before God the Lord will answer them from what is written what he said in the oracles those scriptures will justify the Lord and judge the guilty. It's a courtroom scenario. Where do you think a courtroom gets its basis from? It gets its basis from the great white throne judgment. So when you see a courtroom in the, uh, on the television, it's a basis of a judge, an attorney or lawyer, defence and prosecution. The Lord will answer you will have a chance to give your account of your life. We're not talking about the judgment seat of Christ. We'll come to that another time. We're talking about the great white throne judgment. The Lord will answer his accusers from what is written, what he said in the oracles. Those scriptures will justify the Lord and judge the guilty. The Lord will put the book on them and it will shut their mouths. So you can say, you can have whatever you want, you say and try and justify yourself, or, you know, I wasn't told this, I was, you had your opportunity, you're going to be able to speak in this court. Somebody said that, I don't know how true this is, but maybe the devil will be the prosecutor. Wouldn't that be interesting? The prosecutor versus the advocate. We'll talk about that in a second. When the devil tempts the Lord, or when the Pharisees and Sadducees try to trick the Lord, he answers with what? He answers with scripture. When he is accused, he answers with scripture. When he's on earth, he'll do the same at the great white throne judgment. Look at this. Look at Matthew 4, verse 1 to 11. I found this fascinating. Matthew 4, verse 1 to 11. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterwards a hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written. Jesus Christ went to a final authority and said, It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him, taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, if thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give the, his angels charge concerning thee, and in the, their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Notice the devil is quoting scripture, but misapplying it, misinterpreting it, distorting it. He's a Bible rejecter and corrector. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So he answers scripture with scripture. He quotes scripture. That's his book. That's his final authority. Again the devil takes him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, 
All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. The devil saying that to Jesus Christ. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, third time, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. He's accused by the greatest accuser ever, the devil. And Jesus Christ fights back with what? With the word of God. Fights back with the only offensive weapon that you have, the word of God. When Jesus Christ comes back at the, um, to deliver Israel at the battle of Armageddon, he says a sword's coming out of his mouth. It's the word of God. He speaks and the worlds are framed by the word of God. It's not going to be any difference to the great white throne judge. They, will, they could say whatever they like to justify their cause and he will open that book and he will hit them for six and their mouths will be stopped because of the word of God. I found that amazing. I was getting excited with this. Look at Matthew 22. Matthew chapter 22, verse 15. Verse 15 to 46. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent him out unto their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. You can see they're twisting. They're trying to catch him out. Tell us therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? Or not? You know that? <laughs> but Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? He saw through it. Hey, listen. He saw through it. Show me the tribute money. And they brought, him, they brought unto him a penny. And he sa- saith unto them, Whose is the image and su- superscription? They say unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. What a phenomenally great answer. When they had heard these words, they marvelled and left him and went their way. The same day came to him the Sadducees. So he had the Pharisees in verse 15, the Sadducees in verse 23, which say that there is no resurrection, and asked him, saying, Master, Moses says said, if a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. All they're trying to do, the Pharisees and Sadducees, are trying to catch him out. (coughs) Catching the Lord out. What falls? Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise the second also, and the third unto the seventh. And last of all, the woman died also. Therefore in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? They all had her. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. You don't know the scriptures. Jesus is saying. Jesus is going back to what? A final authority of the word of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that 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 which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. When the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. I'm sure they were. He blew them out of the water. Through the word of God, they accused Jesus Christ and he destroyed them with the word of God. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, that's very interesting, take note of that, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, see now it's all fitting in, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbour as, as thyself. And these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked, saying, now, now who's asking the question? See how it's changed? Pharisees, Sadducees, lawyer, all accusing Jesus, all trying to catch him out, all distorting things, just like the devil did. Then Jesus asked them a question. I love this. Saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, The son of David. He says unto them, 
How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. Hey, how good is that? Huh? How good is that? I love it. Can you see why you get excited when you study this book? Fantastic. I was buzzing, man. When the Lord asks them a question, they cannot answer it. This is what will take place at the great white throne judgment. Look at um, Romans 3.19. I said it would be significant. Romans 3.19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may be guilty before God. A similar passage is in Jude 14 to 18. It just took me there. I'm not saying this is totally... I, I think it's relevant to this, but you, you'll read it and you'll understand where I'm coming from. Jude 14 to 18. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of thee, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among all them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against. Now I know it's coming back at the second coming but it's the same kind of feel to it because the hard speeches, yeah, the ungodly deeds, the hard speech, what they're saying, these are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust and their mouth speaking great swelling words having men's persons in admir admiration because of advantage. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk off their own ungodly lusts. The hard speeches, the great swelling words. You'll say whatever you want and God will answer you from the book. God will answer you from the book. Listen carefully. Remember the guy in Matthew 22 who came to the marriage without a wedding garment. Turn there. Very interesting again. Matthew 22. He's coming to the marriage without a wedding garment. He's confronted by the king. Matthew 22, 11 to 13. And when the king came to see the guests... He saw there a man which had not a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? You know, you know, Jesus Christ called somebody a friend who betrayed him, remember? Judas Iscariot. He calls him friend. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was, what? Speechless. It says, every mouth shall be stopped and the world will become guilty before God. That's what the Bible says. That's what's going to happen at the judgment, the great white throne judgment. This guy tries to get in without the correct attire, shall we say, but we know it's a deeper meaning than that. You can't get to heaven without Christ. You can't put a, if you haven't got the righteousness of Christ, you're not clothed in the righteousness of Christ, you'll never make it. He stood speechless. He was guilty. He had nothing to say. And he said unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You talk about dual application, you could take that for the great white throne judgment, you understand? At the great white throne judgment, every sinner will be given the chance to present his case. God will give every sinner a fair trial. Every sinner will be able to... to um, to, to say or to give whatever is relevant or pertinent to his case. So many people are going to be accusing God. It's like God's going to be untrue. Well, you never told me. I never had this opportunity. It's going to be a fair trial. God will give every sinner a fair trial. And they'll be able to bring up whatever is, ever, whatever is relevant and pertinent to their case. And when that person is through, when that person has finished all his spiel and is trying his self-justification, his self-righteousness, the Lord will open the book. And he will answer all of his accusations, even though he's put God on trial, so to speak, and declare all... God will declare all his guilt 
and pronounce his sentence. And when he does, the only thing that that sinner will be able to say is this. Amen. He'll only be able to say Amen. 100% truth. Truth is truth. The scripture of truth will judge that sinner. And then you will verify and justify your own damnation. Can you believe this? When you hear the Lord say, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, Matthew 25, 41, you as a lost sinner will say, Amen. My judgment is just. You won't be able to say it was an unfair trial. Folks, that is terrifying. Before you leave the courtroom, listen to this, before you leave the courtroom at the great white throne judgment, you will bow your knee and you will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2.11 Don't you think that's wonderful? Don't you think that's amazing? That is so powerful. Could you imagine, I, I pray to God that Richard Dawkins and these idiots who have gone out attacking God in their whole life, spending their time, I pray they get saved. I won't wish this on my worst enemy. But could you imagine if he doesn't? And they haul him up to the great white throne judgment and he stands there before God. And he gives all his spear, all his, he throws out everything he's got, really putting God on trial. This is unfair, I don't believe it. Or he can give everything he likes. And then God opens the book, the scripture of truth, and judges him from it. And then Richard Dawkins would have to say, Amen. My judgment is just. And before he leaves that courtroom, in front of the universe, he will bow down and he will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You talk about the power of God, righteous judgment, a guy who spent his life as a so-called atheist attacking God. You see, everyone in the end becomes a Bible-believing Christian. The sad thing is it's going to be too late for the majority. Then out he goes into everlasting darkness, into the lake of fire for eternity. No hope of ever escaping. That's his life. He's had his life here on earth. He gets judged. He gets cast into the lake of fire. Those who are at the judgment, at that trial, will have no counsel for their defence. They rejected, listen carefully, they rejected the Advocate with a capital A. An advocate is a person who publicly supports or recommends a particular cause. A person who pleads a case on someone else's behalf. Turn to 1 John 2 verse 1. They rejected their advocate. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. That word advocate only appears once in scripture. When that lost sinner turned down Jesus Christ as their advocate, whether he realised it or not, he rejected his defence lawyer, he rejected his defence attorney. If that wasn't bad enough, he rejected a defence lawyer who had already paid the sentence for him. God is a perfect, fair, just judge. And you will get a perfectly fair, just trial. Yet no matter what you say or what evidence you bring, truth is truth. If you are a saved sinner, therefore in Christ, you're either in Christ or outside of Christ, you were tried and sentenced at Calvary. And your sentence was paid in full when Christ died. There's a term, isn't there, called double jeopardy. You can't be judged for the same trial, so to speak. You can't be brought 
to judgment at the great white throne judgment if you are in Christ. Because your trial, you were tried and you were sentenced at Calvary. And because you are in Christ and he took your sin and your judgment and Jesus Christ went to hell for you, you are forgiven and you are acquitted which means formally declare someone not guilty of a criminal charge. You go free because he took your sins and died in your place and you are trusting him for your righteousness. I finish with this verse. Turn to 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5. Verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I am made the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. In fact, I will read just one more passage. The great white throne passage in Revelation chapter 20. Verse 11. Revelation 20 verse 11 And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead small and great stand before God and the books were opened and another book was opened which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. There should be an urgency among every Christian to reach the lost before it's too late. Because that great white throne judgment will be the most horrific thing that you could ever witness. And you don't want your family going there, you don't want your friends or colleagues going there, and you certainly don't even want your enemies going there. So your job is to get out there with the gospel and to reach as many lost folks as you possibly can, praying that God will save souls before it's too late. Let us pray.